Thank you very much, Dylan. Uh, and thank you all for being here. It's really an honor to be here at the Clinton School and to have an opportunity to share with you tonight. Uh, my focus will be on the status of women in Afghanistan and the challenge of trying to bring stability, and peace, and security to that troubled part of the world. Um, this trip that I've just come back from was really my first to Afghanistan itself. Uh, although I've been to South Asia many times, uh, especially to Pakistan and to India. Uh, and those of you who know my book, Gandhi and Beyond, know that I'm a, a student of Gandhi and I've spent many years trying to learn more about the insights that Gandhi shared with humankind about the power of nonviolence uh, and the ways in which we can struggle for justice without using military means. Uh, so that's been my main interest in South Asia. And studying Gandhi as a lifelong enterprise, it's a challenging one. Uh, he's a difficult person to understand. His life was so completely different than our own. Uh, his dedication to justice and nonviolence was so complete and total. Uh, he was a very austere person. Uh, and I often say to my students that if, if Gandhi were around, were around, he probably is not someone we would enjoy spending a lot of time with. Uh, he was such a fanatical religious uh, ascetic. Uh, you know, he was a complete vegetarian. Uh, and he eventually gave up all his possessions in life. He gave up most of his clothes, went around half naked, as uh, Churchill said. Uh, he gave up sex. Um, and he would have, I think, been a really rather humorless, someone you wouldn't want to spend a lot of time with, as I say. Uh, but actually, he was known to uh, offer some humorous comments and some jokes. So, of course, I have to offer a couple jokes, Gandhi jokes, of all things. Uh, you know maybe about his history. In 1931, he came to London for the famous round table negotiations with the British Crown, trying to convince uh, Britain to allow India to go free. The negotiations didn't produce very much. Uh, but during the occasion, Gandhi had a chance to have an audience with the king. So on the appointed hour, he showed up with his usual you know, half-naked condition, you know, loincloth, sandals. Must have been very chilly in the usual London weather, of fog and coolness. Uh, but the re reporters were rather scandalized that Gandhi would show up with a loincloth to meet the king. And they said, Mr. Gandhi, aren't you a bit underdressed for the occasion? And Gandhi said, well, that's all right. His majesty has on enough clothes for both of us. <laughs> And on another occasion, I think it was this trip, uh, the reporter said, well, Mr. Gandhi, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, well, I think it would be a good idea. <laughs> so we can learn much from Gandhi and his vision, uh, as I say, of justice and peace and struggling for our rights for freedom through non-military means is really the ideal to which I've dedicated my life and I think has relevance to so many of the critical issues facing us in the world today. So my lens for looking at the Afghanistan issue is through the security and human rights of women, uh, but also in the broader context of security. Uh, and this is a project that I've been working on with uh, Women's Action for New Directions, WAN, which is helping to sponsor my visit here to Little Rock this week. Uh, and we've worked together to uh, try to bring together communities that over this issue have been slightly torn apart. Uh, we know that human rights and peace must come together. We can't have genuine peace without human rights. And conversely, uh, human rights cannot thrive unless there is a peaceful context. But to some extent, in the uh, Afghanistan debate, we've taken slightly different approaches. Some of our dearest friends in the women's movements have said, well, we have to protect the women, and, and so maybe we need to keep our troops there longer. And our military can be there to help secure and enhance the rights of women and human rights generally. Others of us have said, no, war is not the means for bringing 
human rights. Uh, usually women and vulnerable populations suffer most during war. Uh, and we can't bring about human rights through military means. But it's been, a, it's been a difficult conversation. And so because of that, we wanted to really look more in depth into this question. And that's really what the study does. And uh, my trip just a couple weeks ago was an opportunity to revisit the issues, to look more in depth, and to see how the changing political dynamics and the new security policies of transition towards Afghan responsibility, how that's affecting the rights and conditions for women. And when we were there, we had a chance to visit several dozen uh, key women's leaders and political leaders, research groups, former government, government ministers. Uh, and we learned that many of the advances that women have achieved, the uh, success that has been developed over the last decade, uh, continues and is in many respects uh, being sustained. Uh, and there's no doubt that uh, since the overthrow of the Taliban, uh, the condition for women in Afghanistan has improved dramatically. Uh, we don't have to be reminded about the cruelty and barbarism of the kinds of policies that the Taliban imposed, especially on women. Uh, but with the fall of that government and the support of the international community, uh, new opportunities have been offered and Afghan women have mobilized and organized and taken advantage of those opportunities to improve their well-being, to try to gain greater rights for themselves and their families. So we've now, because of these changes, uh, women have full equality before the law. Uh, and they have been participating in the elections in Afghanistan, although the rate of participation has declined, and I'll say more about that as I go along here, as the uh, political corruption has intensified and deepened in, in Afghanistan. Uh, women now have 25% of the seats in the Afghan parliament. Uh, I wish we had that kind of a ratio of women in the US Congress, for example. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, there is a, a Ministry of, Women Affair, of Women's Affairs. So in the political realm, there have been uh, significant advances. There have also been great uh, improvements in the social areas, uh, in health care. Uh, back in 01, access to health care was not available to most Afghan women. They were forced generally to stay in the home and not given opportunities. Uh, but now, thanks to the international development agencies, to efforts that our own government and the European community and the United Nations and other donor states have offered, uh, health care is now available, it's estimated, to as many as 80 percent of all Afghan women. And especially maternal care is now available. Back in 01, uh, midwives were not available. Uh, most women gave birth without any attendance, and as, as a result, the maternal mortality rate in Afghanistan was among the highest in the world. It's still pretty high, but it started to come down, in part because there has been a significant international investment in trying to improve women's maternal care and to provide uh, midwives, and there is now uh, a school for midwifery, and more than 2,500 women have been trained and are now uh, working in the communities and helping women in, uh, and attending at birth. Uh, so real progress there as well. Uh, there has been uh, progress also at the level of local community development. Uh, the National Solidarity Program in Afghanistan, perhaps you've heard about it, is widely seen as one of the most successful programs in Afghanistan, funded by development agencies. And it channels funds to locally based community development corporations. And in those local community councils, women are playing an important role. It's estimated about 25% of the members of those local councils are women. And it provides a really critical opportunity for women to be active, to have agency, to be involved in these programs. Many of them are microfinance, small scale loans that are helping people find some economic opportunity in their local communities. So these are uh, important gains. Uh, education has been another area of great progress. Uh, back during the Taliban days, less than a million boys 
went to school. Uh, now, more than 7 million, uh, and 37 percent uh, uh, are women, young uh, women, girls, who are able now to go to school. Uh, so this is a, uh, a great sign of progress as well. So there have been advances, and it's important that they be preserved and protected. And one of the fundamental points that we make in this study, and it's in the book, is that as we make a transition uh, from a less direct American military intervention, uh, and as we try to turn over authority more to the Afghan government, uh, we need to sustain the support for programs that are working in the arena of economic and social uh, development. Uh, so it's a critical question. Unfortunately, in the Congress right now, actually, I think this week, the Congress is voting on the USAID budget, and I'm, I'm afraid there are major cuts uh, in the offing. And if that were to begin to affect the programs in Afghanistan, much of the progress that we've achieved could be lost. So there is a good news story in part in Afghanistan in terms of the success that's been achieved through these social programs. Uh, but the problems arise in the arena of security. And we asked everybody that we talked to there, you know, what is the security condition? Most of them said it's not very good. But they also said that more important than the number of troops that the Western nations send or that we have here in Afghanistan, more important than that is the nature of the governance. Uh, we need to have a government in Afghanistan, they said, that we can trust, that can be responsive to our needs, uh, that can be authoritative and uh, implement and uphold principles of law, uh, and unfortunately, uh, that's been mostly absent in uh, Afghanistan. The security situation is very bleak. We were given a briefing uh, on our first day. Uh, this is the Pakistan side of the border. Uh, this chart comes from the Long War Journal. For those of you who study uh, military strategy know this is one of the premier journals on uh, so-called war against terror. Uh, and uh, gives you a very grim picture of how dominant the insurgent movements are on the Pakistani side of the government. This is in the predominantly Pashtun communities. Um, and uh, it's a bit of an irony that one of the provinces that they consider uh, secure, one of the districts, is Abbottabad. And uh, you'll notice that that's where they actually found Osama bin Laden. That's considered a secure district. Um, all the rest is either leaning toward or uh, dominated by uh, Taliban uh, local forces. And if we go across the border into Afghanistan itself, this is a more recent uh, outline of security from the Long War Journal as well, and shows that uh, many of the districts are, uh, have very poor security. Uh, and there's only a, this small belt of provinces just west of Kabul, uh, Bamiyan and some of the others that are moderately secure. Uh, but the grim fact is that despite the presence of 100,000 US troops, 150,000 total international troops, despite the development of a 300,000 person Afghan National Army and National Police, uh, the insurgent forces have been gaining influence. Uh, and they control more districts now than they did before. Uh, we asked a number of people, well, how many armed militants are we fighting against with all these troops? We got different numbers. It ranged between 20,000 and 30,000. It's a pretty small number of active fighters. Uh, and yet, they seem to have control over many of these districts. Uh, it tells us that the strategy that we're employing to date is not working from the security point of view. More troops we bring in, the less security there seems to be in Afghanistan in the, and in the Pakistan border regions. Uh, the more we seem to target the insurgents, the more they seem to be able to uh, develop recruits and gain at least control or some kind of acquiescence at least uh, in many of these local districts. And we were told that people do not want the Taliban back. They had five years of experience of that kind of rule. And they said they really didn't have a government. Government, It was mostly religious fanatics 
uh, trying to change our behavior. Uh, they don't want that back. When there are public opinion polls, the Taliban gets less than 10 percent support. And in the, uh, back to the Pakistan side of the border, when they've had elections in these uh, mountainous regions in the northwest frontier and in the tribal areas, the militant parties affiliated with the Taliban have gotten 10, 15 percent of the vote max. Uh, so something's going wrong in the security strategy, and I think it's fundamentally the fact that we haven't caught on to how people in these countries, not just in Afghanistan and Pakistan, but in many countries, uh, tend to react negatively to uh, foreign forces, what they consider to be occupation forces. And there is a trend that's been well documented by Robert Pape and his colleagues at the University of Chicago and other places that whenever foreign troops come into another country, we tend to see an increase in terrorist attacks, an increase in terrorist recruitments. So the strategies that we're employing in the security front are not working. Um, we, this is just a recent poll on the Pew uh, International polling firm, just to show that our presumed allies in uh, Pakistan are not really with the proposition and uh, tend to disagree with the counterterrorism policies that we're trying to uh, impose upon them and that we've encouraged them to uh, implement. Uh, recent polls showing, actually, this is the same Pew research poll, showing that uh, support for uh, military operations against the Taliban in Pakistan is declining, despite the fact that Taliban itself, uh, that, that Pakistan itself has been uh, severely attacked by uh, various insurgent groups over the recent years. So there's declining support. And we have a partner in the uh, Kabul government uh, that is unreliable politically uh, and that lacks the fundamental capacity that's needed to sustain political support as an alternative to the insurgent forces. We also have a government in Afghanistan that is basically unable to sustain itself. Uh, Karzai is sometimes referred to as the mayor of Kabul, and that's because his writ of authority barely extends beyond the perimeter of the city. Uh, out in the countryside, as those earlier charts showed, uh, it's mostly insecure territory with a significant influence by the insurgents. Uh, and the, uh, this shows the way in which international donor agencies and countries, primarily us here, we, those of us here in the U.S., how uh, we are essentially funding uh, the Afghan government. Uh, and while the government is slowly increasing its revenues, it's far below uh, the total expenditures of the government. Uh, so they are dependent upon us. Uh, and we, during our meetings, we met with the first minister of finance for the Kabul government, uh, Ashraf Ghani, a brilliant mind. Uh, and he said the, one of the biggest concerns for security is that Afghanistan is headed toward a depression. Uh, it's unavoidable as the Western forces gradually begin to uh, step down in terms of their commitment, uh, the amounts of money pouring into Afghanistan will diminish, uh, and the government is not capable of picking up the slack. As we were driving around the city of Kabul, uh, we saw very little in terms of public infrastructure. The roads are terrible. Uh, we saw one new highway being built. Uh, the airport is terrible. Uh, but we saw lots of private homes being built, uh, very expensive private homes. And one of uh, the people we were talking with said, well, those are the poppy palaces uh, being funded by graft, some from the drug trade, some, unfortunately, from uh, corruption based on uh, taking money off the top in, in government funding, money that comes from us and from European governments and from the UN and the Japanese and other donor states. Uh, so it's a, it's a system of governance that is really shallow and unsustainable in terms of its ability to be able to really deliver public services and political goods 
to the population. Now here's a, another chart from this. This is a recent general accounting office uh, study and uh, shows how the Afghan security forces are even more dependent upon international support, in this case almost entirely support from the United States. And here's where there's a really serious dilemma. As I mentioned, they have a 300,000 person army and police force. And when we were driving around Kabul, we saw they were very present in the streets and are trying to provide security in, in the big city. Uh, but it's unsustainable. Uh, the funding is uh, close to six, uh, more than six billion a year for their security forces. The entire budget of the Afghan government is less than two billion. Uh, so how are we going to sustain these forces? Uh, and there actually were U.S. encouragement, they're adding more local police forces. Um, and these police forces, frankly, are not very reliable or very responsive to public need. Uh, there's tremendous amount of uh, abuse going on. You may have seen there was a recent United Nations report uh, indicating that they found evidence of uh, torture of detainees by Afghan national police. Uh, we interviewed a number of women and other researchers, as I mentioned, in Kabul, and some of them said that, you know, we don't get any protection from the Afghan police or army in the streets. Uh, some of them are warlords and criminals who have committed abuses in the past. Uh, one person said, you know, uh, they're worse than the Taliban. Uh, so, unfortunately, we're now stuck with funding uh, these large security forces. Now, we can't obviously just cut them off. The worst thing would be to send 300,000 men with guns back home. Uh, it's going to make the situation worse. But there needs to be uh, a serious rethinking of the security strategy that we've had of building up and trying to train the Afghan national forces. Now, we do need to support their security forces. And our strategy that's now being implemented is to turn over authority to these forces but we have to understand that the total numbers are unsustainable, A, and B, that uh, while we are supporting these forces, we may, should make sure that they follow the law, U.S. law, which is to uphold principles of human rights. You know, it is part of our law that we cannot fund any security forces around the world if they are known to be violating human rights, if they are known to be engaged in torture or other abusive um, actions. Well, that's the case with the Afghan National Security Forces. So uh, we're, we're caught in this double or triple dilemma, depending on how you view it, of being stuck with supporting these forces, but actually being obligated by our own laws to ensure that they uphold human rights principles. And, and then we need to work out a strategy with the Afghan government to gradually diminish the size of these security forces, probably through natural attrition, so when enlistment rates, when enlistment uh, contracts come up, uh, let the troops go home, give them some kind of a severance bonus, bonus uh, and try to help the Afghan government reduce its security forces to some level that's more sustainable for the future. A really difficult dilemma, and no one that we talked to seemed to have an easy solution to this. Uh, political corruption, as I mentioned, has been intensifying. Uh, the parliamentary elections last year uh, up to a quarter of the ballots were declared invalid. Uh, when we were there, there's st still a big struggle going on over the members of parliament who were supposedly elected last time. Uh, there are, I think it's eight or nine members of Congress who are camped out, refusing to leave their offices in sort of their own little Occupy the Parliament movement uh, in Kabul. One woman was on a, a woman member of parliament was on a hunger strike. Uh, so they really still don't have any clarity on the membership of their parliament. Uh, the presidential election was two years ago. Uh, they still haven't filled many of their cabinet posts. There are seven or eight ministers who are in an acting capacity because they haven't been able to decide on uh, the final selections. The judiciary is also in, in poor shape. Uh, there are several senior judges who haven't been able to sit because there hasn't been agreement between the parliament and the Karzai administration about the selection of those judges. Uh, so the governance equation is 
in very poor shape. And as I mentioned earlier, it does, doesn't matter how many troops you have. If you can't secure a solid governmental representation for people, uh, you can't have genuine peace and stability in a country. Uh, security is fundamentally about providing well-being for people, uh, following the rule of law, having responsive services and security for the citizens. But for that, you need good governance. And that's sorely lacking in Afghanistan. And in a way, our whole strategy, I would argue, has been misguided. That's one of the points I make in the book at cons some considerable length. Uh, when we declared a war on terror back in 01, uh, we made a huge strategic mistake. Not that security forces have no role, certainly. Uh, we do need to, at times, use military force, security forces, uh, if we can identify specific militant leaders uh, and either capture them, if necessary, attack them so that they don't threaten innocent people. Those kinds of actions are necessary. But the idea of sending large numbers of military forces to other countries to put ourselves in a position where we are seen as an occupying force, that's not our intention, but that's how people see us, uh, is counterproductive. And as I've mentioned, it's had negative effects in terms of Afghan security. Uh, but it's also contrary to the evidence that's now been accumulated about how terrorist groups end. This study comes from the RAND Corporation. As you know, the RAND Corporation has been a, a major contracting firm working primarily for the Department of Defense uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, since the end of World War II, sorry, so for more than 60 years. Uh, so they're not usually prone to coming up with results that are contrary to Pentagon strategy. Uh, but in this case, they were asked, let's do the quantitative study. What do we know about the terrorist groups that have come to an end? And we find that uh, military force is a, a major factor only 7% of the time. Most terrorist groups come to an end either through a political process or through law enforcement, through effective policing work. Now, this is not so strange to us when we think about some examples. Uh, probably the best known political process is the uh, Good Friday Accords. President Clinton played a key role in negotiating uh, a settlement with the, between the British government and the IRA. Uh, and the, over the years, the IRA has now given up uh, terrorism and bombings and assassinations, has entered the political process, and now those who were identified as terrorists, members of the IRA, like Martin McGuinness, are ministers of state and are engaged in political process. That's what success looks like in the fight against terrorism. The other key way of fighting terrorism is through effective police work. Uh, and usually it's a community policing type of function. I had an opportunity a couple years ago to talk with the superintendent, superintendent of police in London. Uh, and he had been directly involved in interdicting several major terrorist plots in the UK, including, you may recall, in 06, there was the plot to try to bring down as many as 10 airliners leaving Heathrow to the US. Would have been the horrific uh, her, a terrorist attack if it had been successful. That plot was uh, found out and, and it was ended by effective police operations. It was an international cooperative effort. Uh, the police in the UK, the US, Germany, Pakistan, Israel, other countries cooperated, found evidence about uh, these groups of young men in Northern England. And the superintendent told me that uh, the key factor was that the, the police who would walk down the streets, the bobbies, uh, into these neighborhoods, immigrant neighborhoods, mostly Pakistanis in Northern England. And because they had a good relationship with the neighbors, uh, the people would say, well, there's some strange things going on down the street. You ought to check it out. Uh, and they began to accumulate information. They began to uh, monitor these young men and were able to uh, interdict the plot. Uh, and there have been many other cases like this. I've, as I I've say, I've been to conferences on not, this, not only this one in England, but in other places on counterterrorism, met with top police officials in the UK and Europe, the FBI, the New York police, and other places. Uh, there's a constant effort underway internationally to uh, 
surveil and interdict those who are uh, plotting these terrorist attacks. Uh, and it's critically important that that effort be sustained. And that's been the key way in which our security has been maintained these past 10 years, through effective law enforcement, through international cooperation in intelligence and policing. Uh, these are the things that work uh, in countering terrorism. Uh, war, uh, military invasions, uh, long-term military uh, interventions, what are seen as occupations, uh, they don't work, and they have many uh, counterproductive impacts. At the United Nations in 06, at the General Assembly, uh, there was a, a, an important development, didn't get much press in the United States, but the nations in the General Assembly came together around a counterterrorism strategy that focused less on that focused less on hard security measures and more on a holistic strategy, a comprehensive strategy that uses all the elements available to governments to try to counter terrorism. And it's interesting that the first pillar of this strategy was to address conditions conducive to violent extremism. Uh, and we know a lot about what conditions lead to armed violence, lack of economic opportunity, and actually poor governance, weak governance, failing governance is one of the most well-established factors that is associated with militancy, with armed violence and extremism. Uh, this pillar, this, the second pillar of the strategy does talk about prevention and control, and that's where security forces do play a role. Uh, enhancing capacity, uh, enhancing capacity of governments to have more effective police work, but also to be able to monitor uh, their borders more effectively, uh, but also the capacity of international agencies like the UN. And then lastly, uh, is the need to uphold and sustain human rights. Back to the point I was making earlier, that uh, without respect for human rights, we cannot have peace. And similarly, peace itself is necessary to uphold those human rights. Now, we have also, I think, been counterproductive and not following our strategies by the way in which we've approached this problem of countering the insurgency in Afghanistan. Uh, the classic doctrine uh, of counterinsurgency recognizes that uh, winning the hearts and minds of populations is primarily a civilian task. In the classic book, it's 80% of the effort should be civilian, providing good governance, providing economic opportunities, building schools, providing health care, the kinds of things that we are trying to do to some extent in Afghanistan. But unfortunately, in Afghanistan, the effort has been predominantly military. And the programs that I described that are helping women are a tiny part of the overall effort. Uh, we're spending more than $100 billion a year in Afghanistan. Uh, the programs that I described for health care and education and community development uh, are a couple hundred million dollars a year. Uh, so we've got our priorities uh, backward. Uh, and that's why in my book and all the points that I've made in the report and elsewhere, is that it's necessary to demilitarize, to shift the focus away from this predominantly military orientation towards a greater emphasis on development, human rights, and the support for effective governance that respects the rule of law. So it's, it's a tough challenge. Um, and we're now at a point where uh, President Obama and the NATO alliance uh, has made a commitment to make a transition, uh, to shift more towards Afghan authority. Uh, we're in the midst of a beginning of a troop withdrawal, and news reports today suggest that uh, there may be some acceleration of our troop withdrawals, so that by 2014, uh, U.S. combat troops, at least, would be out of Afghanistan. But probably we'll still have some troops there. They would probably be focused more, we're told, on training of the Afghan forces. And as I pointed out, if that's to be the case, then our training needs to really emphasize the importance of human rights for those security forces. So in the book, we outline a, a series of measures that we think are necessary for an effective transition. Because if we're just going to pull out the troops, necessary as that may be, 
and we don't address the many other dimensions of security in Afghanistan, we may end up making the situation worse. And the gains that have been achieved for Afghan women will be lost. Uh, it's unlikely that the Taliban would come back to power, but there could be further civil war, there could be a military coup, there could be serious instability in that part of the world. Uh, developments which would threaten our security ultimately because of the instability and the uh, terrorist activity that has been in that part of the world. So we need to get this right. Transition is necessary, it's appropriate, but just to pull back the troops is not enough. So we've argued for several points. Yes, foreign military disengagement, but we need to pay more attention to uh, a political reconciliation and power sharing arrangement within Afghanistan itself and between Afghanistan and Pakistan and ultimately with the neighboring states, this third point, a, a diplomatic contact group. Right now, uh, Afghanistan is becoming a pawn in the political game between India and Pakistan. Uh, and we need to encourage those two states to work more cooperatively in Afghanistan. There was a, an important meeting yesterday uh, to begin this process, the so-called Istanbul process, where the neighboring states will work together and hopefully from that will come a commitment by these states to cooperate in stabilizing Afghanistan, to not intervene in Afghan affairs, uh, and to try to provide support for the Afghan government uh, to take full responsibility. Uh, this fourth point is a controversial proposal, but one that we've seen as important, namely uh, that there may be the need for an interim peacekeeping force to be introduced into Afghanistan as uh, U.S. and the other NATO troops uh, withdraw. Uh, because if there is a security vacuum, uh, that will invite more insurgent activity, and as I mentioned, it could lead to a military coup, uh, could lead to civil war. Uh, and there has been a proposal that the insurgents themselves have proposed that there could be a so-called Muslim-led peacekeeping force. Now, we don't know what that means. There is no such thing. Uh, but maybe we could work with governments like Indonesia and Turkey uh, to operate through the UN and maybe bring in a peacekeeping force that could provide some political assurance as well as some security protection, especially for women and other civilians who uh, feel increasingly vulnerable and not protected by their own security forces uh, in the transition process that's unfolding. And then lastly is the necessity of sustaining, as I mentioned at the outset, sustaining the commitment that we've made to social economic uh, development programs, health programs that are improving the well-being of people in Afghanistan. It's a tall order, it's a difficult process, and I don't presume to be able to have magical solutions here, but I think all of us need to pay attention to this transition process, uh, encourage the phased withdrawal of our foreign troops there, but ensure that as we withdraw, we attend to the other political, diplomatic, economic, and social dimensions so that Afghanistan can hopefully emerge from this ordeal at a point where it can be more independent, can assure its own security, and hopefully be a stable country into the future. Thank you very much. We've uh, got some time for some questions. If you would raise your hands and let us get the, uh, uh, the microphone to you. Yes, sir. Jack. Hold on, Jack. Let's wait for the microphone to come right here. It's coming right there. Uh, some 80 percent in your chart uh, showed uh, political and uh, governmental uh, success. Political process and, and that, police yeah. law enforcement. Yeah. Given what you said about the corrupt government uh, and the lack of any uh, political process there, it, it seems to me this is a high-risk strategy in doing this. So how, how do you counter this high-risk strategy of taking away the uh, military support? Because it doesn't appear that anytime soon that the Islamic countries will agree to provide an effective 
uh, peacekeeping yeah. core. Yeah. Good question. I mean, ultimately, I think this political bargaining and political negotiating process within Afghanistan uh, hopefully can produce a government that is more accountable and more representative of the broader population. Uh, you know, one of the things that people said about the Taliban, you know, they are brutal and harsh, but they were not corrupt. Uh, and maybe some of their representatives need to have some role. Uh, everyone that I talked to felt that uh, it's very likely that whatever happens, uh, Taliban authorities will have dominant control over uh, Helmud and Kandahar and other southern provinces where they have always had their traditional power base. Uh, that's what power sharing is about. You give some ministries to your adversaries and hope that you can work together to find a political accommodation that everybody will work with. And that's been one of the factors in the insurgency has been the sense that when the Kabul government was created, it was on a very narrow basis, more of the Tajiks from the north than the Pashtuns from the south. Uh, so maybe if they can be brought in and some more representative, broader-based government can work uh, towards a less corrupt, more representative regime. No guarantees, absolutely, but it seems to me that's the only solution. I can't imagine you know, that the Karzai regime is going to change its colors. It seems to be getting worse, actually. So uh, we need to bring some other players in. And whether Karzai is the president or not, that'll be for those people in Afghanistan to decide. But we need to broaden the coalition for sure. Yes, we have a question in the back. Yes, sir. Again, regarding political corruption, two questions. What percentage of the U.S. funds are lost to this corruption? And do you see anything like the Arab Spring movement coming up among the people there to correct this? Yeah. Well, I don't know that we have any figures on the percentage of funding. Uh, but clearly, you know, at the rate that we're funding, about $10 billion a month, uh, you've got to figure some high percent is going uh, into the pockets of the warlords and uh, the wealthy figures surrounding Karzai. Uh, so in terms of whether there is a Arab Spring movement, uh, not in that form. But one of the things that I was incredibly impressed by was meeting the Afghan women who are taking enormous risks to speak out for peace, against corruption, against abusive policies by the police and the army and by the Taliban. Uh, and you know, we were in a, a room one day, we were in a conference room, and they talked about, you know, this, this is not just a, an issue for me. This is my life and my family. I risk my life going out into the streets to go to meetings, uh, to speak up against some of these reactionary leaders. Uh, but I do this because I think it's necessary to create a better life for my family and for my children and grandchildren. Uh, that seems to me where the real hope for the future for Afghanistan can be. And especially because women have taken more of a public role, and not just women, but also young men. We met a number who were very committed. Uh, as we move towards a peace process, whatever the shape that's going to take, uh, one of the lessons from other peace processes that we can apply is the need to involve as many people as possible. If it's just a bunch of men in a room with, who've been mostly carrying guns around the last 10, 20 years, uh, we can predict the kind of result that will come. But if we can involve people at the community levels and bring others into the room, women and those who are not primarily uh, involved with military action, uh, that increases the chance that the resulting peace will be more representative. Unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet, although there will be a, a so-called Loya Jorga, a Jorga, a big meeting, Loya Jorga in uh, Kabul coming up, uh, supposedly for the purpose of trying to pull together social support for the reconciliation and peace process. Uh, so I hope that we can encourage more the, along those lines. And I should say that uh, Secretary of State Clinton has been uh, exemplary in her leadership in supporting exactly that kind of an approach, uh, making sure that women do have a, a role. Well, I know that when she brings uh, delegations of Afghans to the State Department, she says, I won't meet with them unless there are some women in the room. Uh, it's that kind of commitment that's needed, and, uh, and hopefully we can broaden that Base of participation. Yes, sir, right here. Wait for the, he'll get you the microphone right here.
Thank you. Uh, my name is Khaled Ahmad Zai, and I'm from Afghanistan mm -hmm. here, and now a uh, student of international relations. I um, hope my reflections were somewhat <laughs> reflective of what you're. Yes, uh, it's uh, interesting because uh, in the last few years in Afghanistan, what I noticed was a lot of decisions that are made regarding Afghanistan. There's not a lot of Afghans' input in it, and in those uh, policies. Uh, Sometimes they, I, I meet with some Afghans who are in, in, Afghanistan, in Afghanistan working with the U.S. as an advisor, but they, they've been here in the U.S. for the last 30 years, and what they say is very American. Mm -hmm. It's not, when you translate it, it doesn't translate to the common people. And that's the reason I came here to study. Um, do you think it has been shifted? shifted a little bit so that there will be more Afghan input in the future policies? Mm -hmm. Or um, my second question would be role of women. Again, uh, a lot of times when we talk about uh, in the Western media, when, when you hear about women, um, this NGO came in and worked with women, a lot of times they just focus on women and they forget men. Mm -hmm. uh, but actually, if you want to really improve women's condition, you need to work as a couple. Uh, you need to bring the men too because um, they're the head of the family and they're kind of running the whole business. And if, they are, if their mindset has changed, then the woman will, uh, condition would change too. Yeah. Has there been any improvements on that area? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Very good points. Uh, on the first, uh, you're absolutely right. And we did hear this from a lot of people that you know, we as Afghans need to have control over the process, the political process in terms of engaging with our neighbors, uh, and right from the beginning, the Kabul government was one of its big problems is it was created in Bonn. It wasn't created in Kabul. Uh, and uh, even the UN officials who were managing that process 10 years ago admitted that you know, it was a very tiny slice of Afghan society from which they chose the political leaders. Uh, so that clearly has to change. And I know it's the intention of the US, but you know, we still tend to, we like to make the decisions. Um, and that's, I think, one of the reasons why the transition is necessary and uh, hopefully will be the right step forward is because it allows the Afghan people themselves to step forward. Um, and I think that's the, will be absolutely essential to create a better future. Um, and the idea of supporting men and, and families, really, uh, is the key. Um, you know, one of the things they have, they have this uh, reconciliation program, a reintegration program, where uh, former Taliban fighters uh, are given a small amount of money uh, in order to give up their weapons and uh, join with the Kabul government. Uh, we heard from a number of people that the problem is, A, the money is way too small for actually supporting, and B, it's, it's given to the guy only, but not in the constant, doesn't help the family. Uh, and People said, well, we need a package that sustains a family for a year or two so that people can really uh, leave behind that experience with the insurgents and start to make a, a better life for themselves and their families. Uh, so I, I think you're right that the, the idea of working to support families is, is a key solution. Ms. Bumpers, Wait, the yeah. microphone's coming at you, right, right behind you. Oh, okay. <laughs> I've worked with the U.S. Institute of Peace and with Vital Voices, both which Mrs. Clinton helped found, the Vital Voices, and I know they're active there, and that the U.S. Institute of Peace is also active in there. Did you see any signs of, of leadership or uh, direction that they're taking on your visit? I didn't see any reference to USIP. I mean, certainly many of the women leaders who worked with U.S. agencies are continuing to be very active and, and playing an important role. And they're the courageous ones who are standing up in public and saying that uh, the corrupt warlords around the Karzai regime are, are no better than the Taliban in some cases. Um, and so we do need to support and protect them. And, and uh, that, 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 I think, is going forward. Uh, but I think we need to broaden the circle. I mean, most of the people that we talk to, frankly, are those who are you know, dependent upon international funding, you know, they're either the U.S. or one of the European governments. Uh, and uh, we need to involve people beyond that circle. That's important, but we need to really go out to the villages and to the communities to bring in the broader spectrum of society. Suggest that, say, a community like Little Rock 
could do to uh, enhance any of that uh, direction? Well, I think the, there's not much we can do. I think the one critical factor would be to encourage our members of Congress uh, to sustain the funding for health and education and other social programs in Afghanistan. And as we pull back the troops, we're still going to have to fund uh, the society to help it make the transition. The transition is not just a military one, as I've tried to emphasize. It's a social political one. So yeah, our troops will be coming home. That's great. But let's sustain our support for the Afghan people. We're not leaving. The president says we're not leaving. We're going to continue to help the people. Let's help them in social and economic and political ways, uh, as we tried to do on the military side, but do it more effectively through the social realm. Question in the back. Yes. Right here. Matt. Hello, sir. My name is Matt Lyon. I'm a first-year Clinton student here. Thank you very much for being here. Um, you speak a lot about um, how much the, the United States and, and, other, uh, and other donor nations are, are basically propping up the Afghani government. Um, and in the past few years, they've, we've found that they have a very large mineral reserve. And I'm curious, um, I've, I've, I've known that they've, they've talked about the, the negatives, possibly Russia and China coming in, coming in and uh, basically stealing it from them. Are there any, is there, is there a wedge for this? Can, I mean, because they, the, they have the resources now that they can actually create a viable e economy. Yeah, uh, Afghanistan certainly has found that there's very rich mineral resources available there. Uh, which could be developed, and they, if once they are developed, the country can certainly be self-sustaining. Um, we talked with the uh, World Bank representative for Afghanistan uh, while we were there, uh, and he confirmed that point. Uh, but it does take time to develop these mines. There's one that's starting to operate now. Uh, there's several others that could be developed, but uh, the World Bank official felt that you know we're talking five to ten years before these facilities can get up and running. Uh, and the Chinese companies are in the lead now in developing uh, these facilities. Uh, that's not necessarily bad for the Afghans in terms of, but it depends on their capacity as a government to ensure that foreign companies are following the law, are paying their taxes. Um, and this is another area where Afghanistan is still pretty weak. It doesn't have that capacity. So, uh, just to develop those mineral resources requires a focus on that governance issue that I've talked about. Uh, and it makes it even more urgent that there be attention to uh, enhancing the ability of the Kabul government to raise revenues from its own people, from taxes, but also then from royalties from uh, these mines. So we need to cooperate with China on this. And, you know, I've got different opinions from the people that we talked to. But several said that you know, China's interest is primarily commercial here. Uh, politically, they want to see a stable Afghanistan. It's good for them economically and in terms of their own security. So there's potential for cooperation there. Uh, and they have a lot of influence, certainly economically. So I think one of the diplomatic strategies uh, should be to really in encourage a greater Chinese commitment and to work with them. And you know, their companies are probably going to get the, the the advantage in terms of developing these resources, uh, but in terms of the future of Afghanistan, that's probably the best opportunity that they would have. Good question right here. She's going to get to the mic. Is a more significant problem um, that the Taliban has now crossed into Pakistan, getting sanctuary there, and also the role of the Haqqani network, uh, obviously extremely important to the you know, growing instability in the tribal region. Yeah. Well, the Taliban and has been growing stronger, as I pointed out, and the Haqqani network is certainly a key part of that. Um, they don't view it so much as this sanctuary. We, we see the border as very critical. But, you know, that border, the so-called Durand line, was drawn by a British official in the 1890s. Uh, the people in the region never really have accepted it. Uh, and it, it's a broader Pashtun community. Uh, and so there's a sense among those insurgents, apparently, of a, you know, we're all fighting this together. Um, so we uh, will face this problem no matter what we do. And to think that there's a military solution that if we attack enough of these insurgents and kill enough of them, we're going to somehow 
suppress them to the point where they'll make a, a, a favorable political bargain. I think that's folly. And we've tried it for 10 years, and it actually seems to be the trend going the opposite direction. Uh, so we have to accept these geopolitical realities. This is a part of the world that they have considered their own. They don't want foreign forces in there. Uh, there are separate governments, and I do think uh, the border between uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan will be sustained. I mean, some people say, well, there's a big danger there will someday become a Pashtunistan, you know, and there's 40 or 50 million Pashtuns in that area who could perhaps form their own government. But there's really not a sense of a movement for that. That doesn't seem to be what they want. But they do want to be sort of left alone uh, on the Pakistani side and on the Afghan side. Uh, and uh, they don't want foreign troops there. Uh, so from our point of view, what we want is we don't want terrorists coming from there to attack our country. Uh, and that's an agreement that we could have right away. And the, actually, the Al-Qaeda presence has diminished over the years. Uh, the insurgency is a problem as well, but through a political bargaining, hopefully we could come to a point where they would have sufficient say in their local government, at least at the southern area of Afghanistan, that they might be satisfied with that. Ladies and gentlemen, you have a chance now to purchase and sign Ending Obama's War. Let's give David Courtright a wonderful round of applause.